Hello. Hi, everybody. How's it going, Dan? How's it going? Hey, Janet. Hey. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us on this panel today. Um, my name is Janet Carr. I'm part of Link3D. We're a workflow software company. And through my experience, I have seen so many different uses for mass customization, from, you know, uh, tooling, from creating end use parts or prototyping. And I'm really excited that we have this panel that 3D natives help put together for us. And because we have such a wide variety of experts like Harold Sears, who is the technical leader of Atom Manufacturing Technologies at Ford. Also, I don't know if you noticed, but he has a dinosaur on his LinkedIn. So he's also a dino, meaning that he's a Distinguished Innovator Operators Awardee, meaning he's dedicated his life to share his experiences to make sure you guys all learn more about additive and we can all push the boundaries together. Thanks, Harold. Uh, <laughs> we also have Dave Flynn from Materialize, who's the business development manager, who has helped many different companies introduce patient-specific parts, especially in the medical field, um, and other types of consumer products and you know other types of industries across the board to develop mass customized parts. And we're also uh, really lucky to have Dan from Form Labs, who's the business development lead. He has helped bring mass customization for companies like New Balance. Uh, razor maker for PNG and really helped bring this to the mass markets. So really excited to have you guys all here. But before we get started, maybe we can do a round robin introduction of um, each one of you and some of your experiences related to mass customization. Um, Harold, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Janet. So um, my name is Harold Sears. I'm the Additive Manufacturing Technical Lead uh, for the manufacturing organization at Ford. Um, so I, I've, I've been around this industry since uh, 93, uh, 1993, so I've been around it for a while. So we've been part of a lot of the growth and the evolution of, of 3D printing technology since the inception when it was a very fragile little model that you would hold in your hand and very carefully sit down on, on the desk uh, to now prototyping um, nearly every component from road to roof and actually in production with um, some small components as well right now. So it's been quite a growth uh, path that we've been on. Thanks, Harold. And speaking of you know the road and the journey of bringing this together, Dave, do you wanna share, based off of your years of experience, what have you done to help enable this through Materialize? Uh, well, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, uh, the first company that, that I started was uh, actually back in 1989, and one of our investors was an orthopedic surgeon. And even at that point, we were talking about patient-specific implants, you know, um, hip stems and things of that nature. At the time, the technologies were so far off of being able to deliver that economically that it was just just a, a theory um, but those things are real now and uh, you know we're we're bringing um, uh, patient specific surgical guides and uh, implants and various medical devices uh, to the market on a regular basis hundreds every day um, and supporting other uh, mass customization applications in uh, consumer footwear and dental aligners and things of that nature. So uh, it's real, it's happening. Uh, and, um, you know, there, there's been a lot that's that's uh, um, enabled that over the last really, you know, 10 to 15 years to bring it to reality. Thanks for sharing that. And now that technology is here, we've got Forum Labs who has recently also helped take these advanced technologies to bring it to market. Dan, can you share a little bit more about you? Oh yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Janet. So I joined Form Labs about two years ago now to really help them bring their 3D printers into mass customization and manufacturing contexts. And Janet alluded to our work with PNG, with New Balance. And what we do really is try to get rid of all the barriers. I think. Harold and Dave have really talked about all the evolution in 3D printing over the past 20 or 30 years. That's led us to an inflection point now. And what we're trying to do at this moment at Form Labs is get the coin to fall on the side where additive manufacturing is adopted really broadly. And that's what my group at Form Labs is about. 
for that snazzy introduction. You know, a lot of folks think that mass customization is um, something that will definitely help with enabling the supply chain, but also to support better customer experiences. But how does one actually start their journey in mass customization? What are use cases that are easy to start with or programs that might be great, uh, great to develop that can help generate more revenue for different companies? Um, Harold, do you want to start off with that? <laughs> Sure. Uh, so I think to get started on the journey, um, and this is a very popular question. You know, how do we get started? It's it's really, um, I, th I think you have to you you have to kind of drop back a, a minute and you have to take a look at pain points. What what are pain points in your company um, that um, are things that that these technologies may be may be able to address? Um, uh, do you have a particular component that's really uh, expensive to manufacture or do you have one that's really difficult to manufacture and and is there opportunities there to rethink that design if, if you were to remove the, the constraints that you may uh, be faced with in, in your manufacturing environment and, and for example if this if this thing that you identify that's one of your pain points is a very complex assembly with multiple parts it's it's really challenging uh, yourselves and, and the system to say does it have to be that many parts is it that many parts because of our current manufacturing process or is there another reason why and it's it's really challenging those accepted norms that we've lived with for years and years about design and engineering work and, and saying do they really have to be there if someone were to remove those constraints and then it's it's really aligning yourself or identifying folks that can help if you don't have the expertise in-house reach out to um, companies uh, around you, service bureaus, and, and others that are expert in this area. They're usually happy to help and engage in a project to help you move things from uh, just an idea on a drawing board to, uh, uh, or on a whiteboard, erase board, uh, to, to something that's somewhat of reality. And starting with you know design uh, and finding a project to develop, I guess, Dave here from Materialize, you guys help with a lot of the idea conception process. Um, how does one get started and take advantage of these advanced technologies that you guys have already developed that could help jumpstart all this like learning experience that they might need to gather on their own, but with you can speed that process up? Sure, yeah, I mean, it's it's really all about um, uh, the, the need and overcoming obstacles um, uh, to satisfying that need, uh, you know, probably best to provide some examples. Um, if you look at a typical knee implant, everybody's knee is, you know, structurally similar but unique, right? The geometry is all all different sizes, different shapes, etc. But you know, they kind of fall into a, a specific category. Um, however, uh, customizing an an implant for a knee replacement um, is really not practical. Uh, in most cases, in the vast majority of cases. So we flipped that on its head and uh, said, okay, how about if we use standard implants, but we customize the fit? And the, the way that uh, additive was useful in that regard is, you know, we drove that with some of our software that allows us to uh, isolate anatomical geometry from scan data, like MRIs and, and CT scans, things like that. Um, and then design surgical guides that allow us to um, place the implants properly for an individual. So it isn't that the implant is custom, it's that the fit is custom. And, uh, you know, people are getting, you know, especially people my age, getting their, their uh, knees replaced on a regular basis. Having an implant that fits properly doesn't need a revision 10 years down the line uh, helps with minimizing the amount of time in the OR and uh, you know shortening recovery times all of that is driven by these technologies that surround additive manufacturing um, sounds like I'm you know just talking about a surgical procedure but it's all driven by 3d printing and I, I think if I can uh, add to that so to build on what I was saying that's Dave Dave's company materializes an example of where you could turn to for help like that right Dave a person would not need to be the expert. A doctor would not need to be the expert in it. He can turn to you guys for that technical assistance and get started in that. 
Yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, uh, the the set of tools and and um, you know making them all work within a particular application is is uh, the bottom line. So, understanding geometry, under you know having uh, software that can manipulate geometry automatically, especially when you're dealing with high volume cases. Um, uh, automating the setup of builds, connecting with machines, you know, all those pieces of the puzzle are things that we've been developing uh, over the last 30 years. And, you know, it's a, it's a flexible enough tool set that, you know, we can look at uh, the challenges in a particular realm and try to find the right pieces to address that particular puzzle. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, I want to I want to jump in also and just add that like that's really driven a transformation of Form Labs as a whole. You know, we started as a Kickstarter project founded by a bunch of engineers, and as the company has grown, it has grown most quickly in the area of staffing to teach people about how to use not just our three D printers but three D printing in general, at every level of expertise. So that goes for salespeople, service people. I have a team of expert consultants who work with large manufacturers that you can't really be a successful 3D printer company unless you're willing to engage at every step of the way with customers who want to adopt it. Mm -hmm. and, and, speaking of which, oh, and speaking of which, you know, you got materialized with technology, you've got Harold that wants to get in on this. You know, if they wanted to access the Form Labs technology, how do you bridge all this together in a program? Because, you know, it's not like, like P&G and New Balance, they didn't just wake up one day and said, I want to do mass customization, or maybe they did, and then they're like, how do we do it? Um, how does this process start from a machine manufacturer's point of view? Yeah, I really love the idea of customer-facing experiments. And this is one of the things that makes FormOps platform in particular really strong because the cost of starting is quite low. It's not like you're investing hundreds of thousands of dollars just to try it. Razor Maker, so this is custom razor handles uh, for Gillette, started as one person, one printer, one day. One of their engineers just got excited and set up in London making whatever people wanted into razors on a single FDM printer. And when that got a lot of interest, he then turned to, okay, how do we make that into something that's really shippable that we can call a product? That led to the shift to working with Form Labs and SLA for the better surface finish and something you could actually have long-term in a bathroom. But that initial experiment and the spirit of that is really what we like to encourage. Just go out there and put something in front of your customers rather than spend a lot of time in meetings and sketching things. And, and speaking of, you know, just instead of spending so much time uh, planning, um, you know, Harold, from the Ford's point of view, Scott Thompson asked this really relevant question here. It's like, what are different custom manufacturing applications that Ford is dealing with or automotive companies might be looking at that you can share um, that we can all kind of learn from and become more inspired and in seeing how we could maybe take this thought process and bring it back in house. Yeah, uh, so um, what I can share is probably the key key thing there. So let, let's see if we can just pull the curtain back a little bit here, but not too much. Um, so I, I think really one of the places that we're we're really working hard right now is 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 in the manufacturing environment, and and around custom applications, it's around supporting our our, our workforce in building vehicles. You know how how can we make tooling that's um, more ergonomically correct so that it's it's not causing operators issues, uh, you know when they're using it a thousand times a, a day or, or whatever it may be. And and if, if you can imagine a repetitive task and you have maybe a, an eight pound weight to move back and forth a thousand times, uh, you'll you'll get tired. And a person that can hand you that same tool or a similar tool that so, does the same job that weighs two pounds or three pounds, right? You're, you're going to want to hug them at the end of the day, right? And and so so there's lots of opportunity around customized applications within the manufacturing environment. And it's a space that we're really working hard on because we believe there's a lot of value in either in bringing tools to market quicker, uh, less expensive, and, and, and again, more, more ergonomically correct for the operators. Then as you start to look at the actual vehicle, sure, there's tons of opportunity on the vehicle and we're starting down that road. And we announced uh, a couple of applications uh, a while ago where we're actually putting customized, uh, well, yeah, customized parts, if you will, onto um, production vehicles for our, our first time ever. And that it really leads on from there. That's the first step in the journey down that road is, is then now what can we do beyond that? Uh, the application is, is a non-critical uh, part. 
not safety related. Okay, what if we were to take on a part that's safety related? How do we address all the things around that, right? So again, it's 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 really a journey that that we're on, and I think we're on this journey together as a community. A lot of us are, and and pushing the envelope of the machines, the materials. Uh, the entire process, right? Are, are we getting the repeatability that we need? Are we getting the consistent quality that we need? Are we getting all of these things that enables us then to take it to the next level? Mm -hmm. And I think this brings us to the next topic of conversation that I'm really excited to talk about, which is zero production. You know, how do we actually get this to the market where we can actually use it live uh, in our environment rather than keeping in the prototyping phase? Um, you know, you got your software, you got your hardware, material, uh, compliance. What different angles, Dave, you can start kind of sharing with us on that we should consider? Yeah, so when, when we talk about serial production, we're typically talking about uh, re repetitive um, production work so that we've got one part number or a few part numbers that we're building over and over and over again. We have a fixed process that's being executed in that regard. Uh, there, there's a lot that can be learned from the certified uh, manufacturing world that can be brought to bear in a mass customization environment as well. Um, and, you know, things like uh, standard work instructions, um, you know, uh, typical quality control uh, and inspection procedures, uh, all the things that you would expect to find in a continuous production environment, you will also find when you're dealing with mass scale. Uh, you know, one example that that uh, I think um, uh, really supports this is Smile Direct Club. Um, a lot of folks may have seen Smile Direct Club's ads on TV and in various print mediums. Um, they make dental aligners, right? So they, they uh, you can either go to a um, a, a uh, uh, a shop and have your your mouth scanned or you can do an impression and send it in and you get back a set of aligners that will allow you to over a period of time incrementally straighten your teeth well this is a great idea and other companies do the same thing but uh, smile direct does some pretty unique stuff and and but they also present some some huge challenges because it's a mass pro uh, a mass market product that is really uh, customer specific in terms of uh, the product that has to be produced, they're dealing with tens of thousands of sets of teeth every day. And so the, the number of files that are flowing into their process that have to be uh, checked and oriented and modified for production, batched up, made their way onto the machine, um, and then executing that on a fleet of, of 3D printers, um, those are all challenges. And just the sheer volume of data uh, that, that comes along there um, uh, presents a challenge. But in, in, you know, what, what that is is really a continuous production line of completely unique geometries. They're, they're all teeth, and they all look the same at you know at, a, at an arm's length but every single one of them is unique so uh, you know the ability to be able to uh, you know put several hundred parts into a build envelope um, and manufacture those in a consistent repeatable way uh, is is really um, uh, the challenge here and it's what you know what the the technology and the tools enable so um, that's a you know that's a real it's a real application that's happening as we speak, and uh, it it uh, just proves that you know with the right tools and and the right understanding of manufacturing principles, uh, you can pull off the uh, the manufacturing of components at scale that are truly unique. Mm -hmm. And digital infrastructure is definitely important for capturing, ensuring the fixed workflows, monitoring if you meet those controls. You know, form labs. You guys have helped uh, bring lots of products to market on the consumer side, um, probably that I can't disclose because of NDAs. But anyways, how does one um, how does one think about how to manage you know fleets of a hundred form last printers versus if they were to maybe go with uh, smaller sets of industrial large printers from your perspective to scale out um, zero production. Yeah, it's a great question, especially as we're seeing more and more facilities with large numbers of our printers. And the first thing that I'll bring up about facilities with hundreds of Formlabs printers is the modularity becomes the driving attribute of the facility. 
And what that means is you achieve uptime by swapping machines in and out. So the occasional form ops machine will go down. That's okay that, you know, if you've got 100 machines, you're 99% up if one goes down and you've got one or two on site, you do a swap and then ship to us the machine that's gone down or repair on site and we'll get you a replacement. What's, what's key about that is you then can be pretty confident that your facility is gonna be stable, but you need to manage these 100 units. And so we've created cloud software where we call Dashboard, which is just for managing your fleet of printers. And over time, we're adding more and more features to that that let you manage these large facilities. And that can be things like routing print jobs to whatever printer is available, scheduling them across fleets of printers, doing various administrative work group management things. But it's been really interesting, especially, I mean, to talk about part serialization as an aspect of this too, where if you're then running this large facility, you need to trace back what you made to a specific printer. And that's something that we're really excited to actively work on going forward. Mm -hmm. And the world, you know, you are, you are the buyer here. You're bringing serial production to life. Do you agree or disagree with some of the point of views that Materialize and Form Labs brought to the table? Um, how, how are we supposed to do this and really bring this uh, to mass customization? And David Alarco also adds, you know, with digital software, potentially identifying, tracking through printing and downstream processes is important. Um, how does that tie in uh, everything that we've talked about so far? So, um, I no, I, I don't disagree with, with either one of them. It, <laughs> and it'd make for a little spicier conversation if I did, I, I guess. But uh, no, it's um, it, it really, it's it's everything that, that um, Dave and Dan uh, mentioned, but and even more, there's there's so many more questions that have to be uh, answered. Um, it, and and as we get into um, some automotive parts where tolerance in, is is an issue, um, we start looking at consistency across machines then too. So if you have a a bank of a hundred printers, is printer number twenty seven printing you know the same as printer number uh, eighty eight? Um, and if it's not, um, one, how do you know it? And 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 two, how do you fix it? So um, access to data in process monitoring is really important. And and uh, um, as 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 Dave was mentioning, um, the amount of data that you could have to deal with um, for for the applications he was talking about, individual unique pieces, a little different for this. This is just constant streams of data coming from the machines, and how do you handle that and monitor that? It's a massive amount of data, and especially if you're talking about a bank of 100 machines. So you monitor it, something looks astray, how do you react to it? So are the machines open and friendly to industrial um, automation and monitoring type uh, processes and software? Um, you know, when that machine is, is finished with a job, is it capable of, of saying, hey, I'm done with this job, somebody come and take care of me, and uh, it, it summons uh, basically an AGV to go uh, over to it with a robot and, and remove the job and, and put a new plate in it and start the next job. Can we do those things, right? Um, and, and can we do them on a consistent basis, time after time after time, with minimum downtime, minimum maintenance, uh, and those sorts of things, right? Um, software is, is a huge piece of that whole thing then. How do you handle that? How do you control all that? How do you do, handle all those communications? Um, really, really big issues that, that we're working on and, and talking to lots of companies about right now. Seems like a lot of the challenges with mass customization are just, uh, just the same with, um, are very similar to the ones for production as well that we've seen in other conversations throughout this event. Um, one thing that you know I'm really excited about, and so is Filippo Val Fiotis, sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, uh, was you know we've seen customization influencing consumer goods, automotive industries, and other industries, right? Um, what are things that you guys are excited about that's going to influence this area of personalization even more? Um, who wants to take it first? Um, oh, I think. I think that, that um, uh, the improvement in materials that have enabled uh, uh, the production of custom uh, consumer goods is one of the one of the big steps forward that will 
really expand the market. Now, I should probably just hand this right over to Dan because the work that he's done with, with New Balance is, is uh, uh, perfectly applicable here. But to be able to actually 3D print a consumer product like a shoe and have it be useful and be able to sell it at a reasonable price, that's huge. Uh, you know, in the industrial design market and other consumer goods markets, this kind of individualization is is very exciting to me. Yeah, I mean, I'll happily jump on that, Dave. What what we're seeing, right, is that a consumer good application will sponsor a material or a technological advance that we can develop within Form Labs, then apply really broadly. So that New Balance example, we did a material for them that can be used for athletic shoe midsoles. Turns out that material has a lot of other uses. It makes good bike saddles. It's viable for insoles for medical purposes. Like there's lots of different things you might want to do once you've developed this new chemistry. And then also there's a family of chemistries around that that give you related material properties, but can be tailored to other specific applications. And so I think one of the really cool things I've seen at Formlabs is because we're so integrated between the materials and the printers that we're able to really push forward into new applications in a stepwise way. We climb up that staircase of, okay, we've accomplished this. Now we can use everything that we learned to go for the next harder thing. And that's driving us into more demanding markets like medical, where you know once we have that biocompatible certified facility, we can start going into deeper and deeper levels of FDA cleared applications. Mm -hmm. And how about you, Harold? Uh. It, it's hard for me to put a list together of the things that excite me because I, there's there's so many things that these technologies enable that excite me. Um, starting back with one of my earlier comments, uh, ergonomically correct tools to make people's job easier, right? That that's exciting in itself. Or, um, it, it, you know, making people's lives better, making them uh, happier with their jobs at the end of the day. But but then you move on and and to jump on the material comment, it's advancement in materials, it's advancement in the in the technologies themselves. Um, you know, ten years ago, uh, everyone would have laughed you off if you talked about um, bringing an automotive production volume piece into to the market, right? Of of, of the idea of making 50, 60, 100,000 pieces a year. Um, they said, are you kidding me? These technologies will never do that. They're only for prototyping, right? But now we're seeing the advancements in the technology and materials that, that are enabling us to, to start into that, uh, start down that road in that journey. Um, excitement about many of these companies are embracing open control systems uh, that, that can com communicate, as I said earlier, with plant floor systems to, to enable us to put smart, smart factories together um, with advanced automation to to uh, lower costs, reduce uh, 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 labor, and things like that. Um, the the idea of of being able to bring a customer maybe into a, a Ford dealership, and and uh, we have our, our our customization center over here in the corner. Miss Miss Customer, come on over and sit down with a, a design engineer, and let's talk about how we can make this interior of your vehicle more personal to you, or or. Let's give your vehicle a personality in itself and let's do some things to the outside of it that's uniquely you, right? Um, and, and be able to do that and, and be able to offer that as a service. Those, those are things that really excite me is, is the, um, what, what's lying here in front of us that, that we're now starting to grasp onto. Um, training programs uh, is equally as important. I think there was a little bit of a reference on uh, Dan made to, to training. Um, huge piece of this whole thing you know how do we get people to think differently uh, how do we get designers and engineers to to push aside that book of standards for a little while and, and open up their their mind around what the possibilities could be um, and then again with oh no I think we just lost Dan Harold in his momentous speech <laughs> it in the meantime, while he comes back up, what do you guys think about texturizing tool that will help provide different user tactile experiences? Oh, oh Harold, you're back. Do you want to continue resuming? <laughs> I thought you guys were gone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was done. I hope I finished. <laughs> yeah, I, um, just one comment on, on uh, some of what Harold was saying before moving on to texturing. Uh, if, if I might, um, 
I think that, that a couple of the keys here are connectivity and, and automation. And in the connectivity realm, uh, I've been encouraged by the fact that companies have been more willing to adopt existing standards. And there's been some, uh, some momentum behind developing uh, 3D printing specific standards, which I think, it, which I think is very important. Um, you know, as an example, our, our build processor system allows uh, uh, the uh, communication of data from machines to, to external software using the OPC UA standard. It's a common standard. It's been out there for a long time, and it, it allows uh, really any uh, manufacturer to make their machine connectable to a, uh, a production environment for 3D printing purposes. So that's a perfect example there. Uh, and then also uh, automation in terms of, of uh, data preparation and driving data to machines, but also in handling physical components, um, things that are that are really focused on uh, connecting into the, the design aspects of the unique data that we're dealing with on a part by part basis, uh, along with just the typical need to move things around and keep track of which operations are, are being performed and, and which are completed. So connectivity, automation, those are those are key to making this all happen uh, in a way that is profitable and uh, uh, and actually marketable. Yeah, and we sorry to hijack the topic. There, we, we take it to heart, right? We we've created APIs now, both for our printers and for our cloud dashboard, so that industrial users can integrate with what we do. And what's really exciting about Formlabs is you can even shoot files directly to the printers, whereas some, some solutions are still working on that. So you guys are definitely ahead of the game there. <laughs> um, That's the goal. On another note, we have an anonymous question that rose above all the other questions for now. What will be the main application of mass customization? Maybe you can name two. <laughs> Harold, do you want to talk about this? I know you talked about it a little bit, but what is the main one that I, I think, that you might want yeah, to I, I, I think, um, it, you know, if I answer that question just with today, it's, it's really in that manufacturing space for us. But I think in the future, you know, as we evolve, um, it, it's, it's going to be a lot more customer driven. It's going to be what does the customer want to cut, um, customize in a vehicle? What, what, what pieces of it um, do they want to have a say in? And then, you know, part of that question, uh, you know, it, it generates, I guess, another question is, is um, hey, Janet, do you want to print that on your own printer at home? Uh, do we want to give you a tool set that helps you design a, um, a better uh, cup holder area in your console and you can print it on your own printer? Or would you rather uh, come in and sit down with somebody and, and explain to them what you want and have it printed and, and delivered to you, right? And so it just, again, these conversations just bring more and more questions about um, what do you want to do? Because there are a lot of possibilities um, from my perspective. This industry is listening right now. This industry is is waiting to hear what people want to do, and they're more than willing to start to work with it and go in different directions uh, to to fulfill those needs. So does that mean we're all going to have the Rolls Royce experience at Ford? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say you were. I was just saying that, that what what's possible out there, right? And what excites me is the possibility of being able to do things like that. Yeah, Dave, you were just about to say something. No, I, I just on this uh, the topic of applications. You know what's going to be popular. I think what is popular is probably going to continue to be popular. Wearables and medical devices are very important, and we see medical devices everything from implants to surgical tools to dental aligners to eyeglass frames that that are custom fit. Um, uh, and then on the wearable side. Uh, you know, uh, footwear products of various types. Um, you know, whether it's whether it's in, you know entire uh, shoe designs or insoles. Um, those kinds of things are are natural because every individual has a you know a uh, slightly different uh, need, and these applications make it possible to address those. Whereas in the past, it was simply impossible um, uh, in in uh, you know in any case where you had to develop tooling. So. It's the old story of 3D printing. It's all about toolless manufacturing. Hmm. And, and yeah, Jen, I, 
Um, do you have a comment that's more specific to how we can use the Forum Labs technology to print mass customization of large volumes? We have one audience asking. Yeah, so quick plug, we just released our large volume printer, the Form 3L. It's really big. You can print a full-size bike helmet on it. And we're really excited to have that going out into the world. So that, that's like my first pointer. But what I would say is, you know, if you really want to mass customize something, it's got to be cost effective. And 3D printing something the size of a bike helmet is not necessarily going to be the way to do that. You'd much rather find a couple of key touch points that you can customize. Because, you know, the goal of a lot of mass customization is to respect the human body, right? You want to be able to deliver someone an experience that's comfortable, that fits well, that isn't painful, that delivers the medical result that they want or the dental result that they want. And you can often do that creatively without printing the whole object. And so a lot of times, if you want to do something big, you identify the small places that interact with the person, and those are the things you customize. Great to know. And another follow-up question for you, Dan, putting on the spot here. How long did it take Form Labs to deliver the project for Gillette um, or you know, New Balance? Are you allowed to talk about this? Yeah, I, I'll speak generally sort of about the average of those two projects. One of the key things to understand is they're multi-year, multi-phase things that go through, you know, different phases of development, different releases. Like with New Balance, we've done two different shoes with them already. Gillette Razor Maker has had multiple phases. We did the custom razor handles. We did the Apollo Moon Landing limited edition, some other stuff in between. The key thing to understand is that the largest, longest time bit of these has nothing to do with the technology. It's it's all the cat herding and people convincing. Actually implementing a factory full of 3D printers just doesn't take that long. But getting everybody agreed that there's a business case for it and that we're really moving forward with it and we're really gonna train factory staff to use these printers, that, that's the time consuming part. And so when I think about like, you know, nose to tail going from an idea to an additive factory, I really think of those as averaging 12 month engagements, where most of that time isn't spent on the factory floor. Most of it is spent figuring out who all the stakeholders are and getting them on board. And I see you nodding hard there, Harold. How many types of walls have you had to bring together to just get a program going or look at consumer type experiences? Um, I'm just curious if you're allowed to share, unless that's a secret sauce. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if it's a secret sauce, but I, I don't know um, if um, how much I could really talk about. But really, it's it's uh, it's 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 a team it's a team process, right? It's it's a team uh, event, um, and and it really starts with the design, and it really starts with me as thinking thoroughly through the design and. Um, you know, and designers need to not only start, understand design for additive manufacturing concepts, but for them to understand the technology well enough to know what they're asking to be made. Um, for example, support structures. A lot of processes require support structures. Is the part being designed and oriented on the build platform such that support structures can be removed easily, or will they be buried inside of a part and, and they can't be removed so they have to understand that but then after the design is accepted then it's it's really moving on uh to to challenge the whole paradigm of okay now we need to kick off a tool and oh the tool's got uh, 18 months lead time on it and we've got to do this and we've got to do that we really don't have to do that now you've got a bunch of things you've just enabled yourself to do uh, if you're going additively, number one, your prototypes are job one in 10 parts. They are made with the same material, same process you end up doing in production, right? So now you're getting manufacturing people on board um, and, and the whole entire process. So really it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult road. It's a step-by-step, -step, check the box, move on to the next person, get them on uh, to sort of jump in the wagon with you and, and pull it along to the next person. So I don't think there's any one place I could point or um, you know, a specific process I could describe other than, than really you've, you've got to get everybody aligned. And uh, just a little plug for AMUG since you're a dyno, and that's why joining organizations like AMUG is very helpful because you can then, you know, connect with people who've been there, done that, and then you don't have to reinvent the wheel. But speaking of reinvent, not reinventing the wheel, Dave, anything you'd like to share since you've helped so many companies from all over 
to achieve these types of programs as well? Well, you know, um, my job is primarily about process consulting and uh, developing solutions for um, specific goals within organizations. You know, whether it's setting up a prototyping operation or enabling a mass customization application. You know, it, all of these things boil down to uh, how do you utilize the tools that are available and then how does that inform your roadmap for product development going forward. But, you know, as it stands right now, you know, when I walk into a customer's facility, you know, I start asking questions like, where's the data start? Who sends it into you? How do you manage it once it's in the door? Um, what are you currently doing in manufacturing that, that uh, we're going to need to either improve or replicate in this new environment? So, you know, things like, you know, we already hit on some of this. Um, do the parts need to be serialized? Do you need to be, do you need traceability through your process? Do you need to be able to automatically nest things? Um, really understanding the the uh, nitty gritty of of how to execute the application allows you to kind of uh, focus in on on a solution. And you know what we find um, you know in terms of timelines is that typically uh, you're looking at anywhere from from six months to a year and a half. Um, before you have um, a, a, a solution up and running because there are a lot of things to consider and a lot of change to manage over, uh, over that period of time. Um, you know, we don't, we don't necessarily change the things you do, but we will certainly change how you do them. And, uh, you know, so that's, um, uh, you know, that's, that's the point I just wanted to touch on here. Thank you so much for that. Does anyone have a quick comment on how color plays into mass customization before we do a final roundup of this panel? Well, uh, I just I, a few thousand dollars worth of Pantone chips. So <laughs> but maybe I'll just leave it at that. Like it comes up and color matching, you know, is something where we have to get better at at Form Labs. Right now we're we're kind of at the level of doing custom colors pretty frequently for customers. But even on the SLA side, where pigmenting is pretty easy, as opposed to SLS, where it's a little bit more challenging, the you know color matching is something that we're getting asked for more and more. And how about you? That's tough. Yeah. Well, you, mentioned, you mentioned textures. So textures, uh, colors. Um, you know, if you, if you look at mass-produced uh, plastic objects, especially, um, uh, that technology, you know, injection molding is so far advanced, so far beyond where we're at with 3D printing right now. Uh, that's a that's an opportunity uh, in the market to improve, um, to be able to re accurately replicate the kinds of parts that you get out of tool out of a tool on a 3D printer is um, that's a, that's a new horizon out there. Yeah, and the, the whole idea of color is, um, yeah, I know we've uh, had some printers around now for a few years that have been making color parts, um, but they, they haven't seemed to, in, in my world at least, they haven't been real mainstream. And so as we start to introduce the concept of color in parts, we get up, oh, whoa, are you kidding? I, I can do this in color now? And so I've seen some actually pretty cool concepts uh, that involve uh, some multiple colors um, for, for 3D printed parts. Um, that, like I just said, was they're very cool, um, and it's like, oh wow, okay, yeah, this could work. Um, so now it's going to really be a challenge of material properties, right? Are those, are those color printers and, and materials that are in those color printers uh, really going to be robust uh, materials, robust enough to put to put in a car, uh, or on the outside of a car? And as we finalize this panel, this was super insightful. Um, do you, any of you guys have any last things you want to share to wrap up, starting with Harold? <laughs> Go first. Uh, you know, I, I, th I think I, I've said a lot about what excites me about the technology, about this industry, about the possibilities of it, really. And, and I just encourage people that if you haven't done it, try it. Uh, you don't have to uh, go out and invest in, in a two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollar machine to try it. Um, there are low cost uh, systems on the market. There are also service bureaus on the market uh, that, that are happy to, to step in and help you and, and have on staff the expertise to to help out their companies, um, you know, like materialize it with people like Dave that 
that can come in and really look at your process and challenge you and ask you some questions that'll make you rethink the way you're doing things. And then, then guys like Dan that can come in and show you, oh, here's how we could set this up for you too as well, right? Um, and so that's the thing, you, you, you gotta try it. Um, and, um, and, and failure is, is eminent, you're gonna fail, um, but failures are opportunities to learn, right? As we all know. Um, and so, um, you know, keep, keep the end goal in mind, keep, keep your eyes on the horizon and know where you wanna go with the technology or at least um, a concept of where you're going with it and, and just give it a shot because there's a lot of benefits. I will say, it doesn't do everything. I'm the first one to admit that. I've been in this for 27 plus years now, and it won't do everything, but it's gonna do a lot, and it's gonna do a lot more for us in the future than it has done today, too. So I'm pretty excited about the future for it. Thank you, Harold. And Dave? Yeah, just to, to expand on uh, one of Harold's last points there, uh, you won't succeed without failing first. So fail quickly. Um, and fail often, and uh, the you know, 3D printing um, technologies allow us to do that because we don't have to invest in in things that have a long time frame associated with them. Um, uh, I'm very excited by where the the industry and the technologies are going. Uh, when I look at where we started uh, and the things we dreamed of, but we're simply not able to do, versus where we're at now and um, the kinds of real applications that are that are being executed on a daily basis. Um, there's opportunity out there, and I just, you know, I'm really happy to see people like you, Janet, and you, Dan, involved in uh, this, bringing a lot of brain power and, and insight and creativity into this market. Um, it's very encouraging, very exciting. And Dan, any last words? Well, what I would say is, if you're interested in pursuing mass customization, don't underestimate the ability of the industry as a whole to come together and support you. I think we've talked a lot on this panel about individual companies having resources to educate, train, set up factories, but a lot of companies will just partner to get things done as well. And that's one of the things I've really enjoyed about being in the additive manufacturing industry is just working across multiple companies with different expertise areas to do some of these big customer installations, even in some cases that involve multiple equipment manufacturers. And you know, the flip side of that is if you are a player in the additive industry, partner with us, right? There, there are lots of ways that we like to work together with companies to get these big things done. And I think the, the more that we as an industry embrace collaboration, the better these applications are gonna turn out. Well, thank you so much, Harold, Dave, Dan, for sharing your insights, talking about how you get started with uh, mass customization, looking at different ways on the ergonomic side, use cases for tooling, for following what the customer wants. And then also talking about how there are different um, technology advancements, not only on the material development side, which we're still working on as, as, an, as an industry, but also on hardware to make sure machine to machine we can make sure that they all produce the same thing with the same um, output, but also on the digital side, being able to trace and track and automate the entire workflow so that you could actually do mass customization. Otherwise, it'd be pretty hard on the administrative overhead side. But also that there are certain um, technologies we should look forward to, such as texturizing tools, uh, color that we can see, um, really bringing up that um, die to match experience that consumer brands us to be able to do and that this is a, a long this is hopefully not a long journey but this is a journey that we can all get involved with and there is a whole industry that's ready to work in partnership together to get those standards in place to enable um, more technology advancement so that we can all get to this point so thank you so much Dan Harold Dave and 3d natives for putting this all together really appreciate it thank you, thank you. Thank you.